You are tuned in to the State of Cannabis News Hour, where industry leaders, regulators, and lovers of cannabis gather collectively to move policy forward in an inclusive and sustainable way. Professionals and canicurious alike can tune in to hear leading cannabis experts share and discuss headlines, critical industry issues, social topics, and more. The State of Cannabis News Hour, your daily dose. Hi, and welcome to the State of Cannabis News Hour, where we bring you all the top stories you need to know and talk about them for four minutes and 20 seconds. Our news is bite-sized and infused with a nice mix of facts, opinions, and a pinch of humor. It's Monday, January 24th, 2022. This is episode number 200. Woohoo! I'm Susan Sorries, the founder of the State of Cannabis News Hour and Conference, author of the children's book, What's Growing in Grandma's Garden, and Cannabis' Favorite Grandma, aka Nanogram. If you're listening to the podcast or watching the show on you, our YouTube channel, the show is live every weekday at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on Clubhouse. Join us and over 24,000 State of Cannabis News Hour members if you want to be an audience participant. Otherwise, please subscribe and support our show. Today, we're talking about big tech is warming up to cannabis, cannabis and pregnancy. An ancient Chinese tomb reveals a love of cannabis, a delivery bill in Maine, Arizona sales are on fire, is weed bad for you, cannabis tourism in the Caribbean, banking trends in legal states, bringing ancestral wisdom into mainstream cannabis, and many other frosty nuggets. So stay tuned for the full 60 minutes of the State of Cannabis News Hour. The following program contains coarse language and nudity. Viewer discretion is advised. Audience, feel free to raise your hands if you want to weigh in on a particular headline after it's been read, and we'll try to bring you up to the stage. Keep it brief and relevant, or you might get the gong. We love the gong. Give it up for co-producer Priscilla Agonzillo. She's a Canamomipreneur, multi-award winning influencer, CEO of the award winning Original Breeders League, and a smoking superhero. She's known for keeping elected officials accountable and having some pretty fire weed. Priscilla, what's your headline for today? Good morning, Susan. Good morning, State of Cannabis. My headline is... Big tech is finally warming to cannabis and the cannabis industry. Now, everybody knows about the issues faced by can- the cannabis industry and big tech. Um, you know, do they shut down accounts? Yes. Uh, do they block you from advertising? Absolutely. So in addition to social media outlets like Facebook and Instagram, both owned by Zuckerberg's Meta, cannabis-specific content, ha- content has previously been aggressively uh, but inconsistently suppressed by companies like Apple and Google. In the, later, in the, in the other case with Google, the search giant prohibits advertisements for substances that alter mental state for the purpose of recreation or otherwise induce highs. It's a very frustrating restriction that has led to a cottage industry of marketers offering clever workarounds. So some of this was kind of relaxed in 2021. Apple adjusted their app store review policies to exempt legal cannabis dispensaries from their prohibition against apps that facilitate the sale of controlled substances, providing a streamlined mobile experience for delivery services uh, services such as uh, Leafly. Uh, Some companies continue to dig their heels in. Google has clarified uh, just recently that apps that facilitate the sale um, or cannabis or cannabis products, regardless of legality, are not welcome on the Google the Google Play Store. Uh, notably, though, in 2021, one of the largest tech companies in the world, Amazon, uh, definitely ranked higher on the Fortune 500 list than Apple, made a series of very bold moves in support of the cannabis industry. The company made two very significant announcements. First, they adjusted their standard drug testing policy and will no longer include cannabis in their comprehensive drug screening program for or any positions not regulated by the Department of Transportation. Second, they expressed their support um, for the recently introduced Marijuana Opportunity and uh, 
Investment and Expungement Act or the MORE Act. Uh, finally, they put their money where their proverbial mouth is and have lobbied on Capitol Hill in support of federal cannabis reform. The company disclosed that some part of their $4.7 million that were spent in lobbying in Q quarter three of 2021 was dedicated to issues related to cannabis reform, including the Moore Act of 2021 and the Cannabis Administration and Opportunity Act. Uh, so remember that Amazon doesn't just sell tangible goods. It's a really a tech company that through their cloud computing platform, Amazon Web Services essentially runs a large chunk of the internet. Um, Amazon's portfolio is stuffed with significant assets all in all areas of physical and e-commerce, from grocery stores like Whole Foods to the streaming uh, sites Twitch and even the online pharmacy PillPack. The purchase of the, of the virtual pharmacy suggests that Amazon is laying the groundwork for selling cannabis online once cannabis is fully legalized at the federal level. Amazon's participation and cannabis is clearly tied to federal legalization of cannabis, with Amazon's model disrupting and dismantling traditional retail brick-and-mortar operations. My question is, is what do you think that they will do to cannabis retailers? Uh, this is Priscilla reporting on tech uh, coming into the cannabis space and would love to hear my fellow correspondents and what they think about that. Priscilla, did you see that Mark Cuban launched an affordable online pharmacy? Yes, I did see that. I mean, this is uh, online pharmacies have really been popping up um, uh, just for medicine in general. I know that the, there are a lot that are tied to like uh, platforms where you can get and do now these like consultations online. So more and more doctors are, are, are jumping on to, you know, uh, using tech in medicine. And, you know, I really do think that this is something that's going to be adopted into the cannabis space. But what does this mean for retailers and what does this mean for brands? Um, I do think that we need to achieve some federal platform or some uh, federal uh, legalization before that really happens because you can't really control it that well. But um, other than that, tech is definitely moving in in a big way. Mark Cuban's going to run for president. Mark my words. Am I, Amazon so. also I don't disagree with you, Rico. Am Amazon also tried to get in healthcare as well with uh, Morgan Chase and Berkshire Hathaway with a venture called Haven, but it, it failed. But uh, Amazon still has their Amazon Care, so they're, they haven't taken their eye off completely of healthcare. Well, I yeah. Absolutely. There was earlier on the news, they were talking about Googleplex um, and how it would be this uh, potential area, like you would stay at work forever because they'd have every single thing for you. They would have to have a dispensary. So it sounds like they're preparing for that. And it is scary for, um, I don't know, I'd be curious to see what happens for retailers. Is this good or not? Well, we've reached time on that headline uh, so and we've got a lot of stories today. So up next is Rico Lamite. He likes to ask the tough questions that the mainstream media refuses to ask. The self-proclaimed dopest dad alive is also a superstar at cracking dad jokes. Find him on TEDx or at one of his Cannavision events, but always find him here every weekday as co-producer of the State of Cannabis News Hour. What's your headline, Rico? Hey, Susan, real quick. Um, I wanted to cede my time to fellow dope dad Chris Eggers. Um, he has a little um, issues going on with his daughter as well. So he used to chase down suspects before reading their Miranda rights. And now he reads the spiciest Mary Jane news stories on Monday morning. His former cop is the cannabis security consultant at CC Security Solutions. Mr. Chris Eggers, what you got for us this morning, my man? Yo, one dope dad to another, Rico. Really appreciate you. Yeah, right now uh, I'm just chasing a one-year-old around, and uh, and I need some dope dad vibes your way uh, over here. But thank you for letting me uh, roll with this article. It's from Maine, um, and we get to say the word Mainers. I didn't. That's a that's a it's a great word. I like it. Um, my article today talks about how Maine is going to um, start to introduce a bill to allow marijuana deliveries. And the headline reads, Maine Dispensary Support Bill to Allow Marijuana Dispensaries. So Mainers first voted to legalize adult use marijuana more than five years ago in the first adult use stores opened in 2020. But lawmakers are now looking to, at taking adult use sales one step further through home delivery. Right now, home delivery for medical marijuana is allowed in Maine, but delivery for adult use is not. State Representative Joseph Perry is introducing a bill to change that law. And Perry said, quote, rather than have people drive very long distances to go an adult use store or turn around to the legal market, I think it makes sense to allow them to purchase it legally and have it delivered to their home. 
Perry's bill would allow certain retail marijuana stores to deliver adult use marijuana, regardless of location, regardless of whether or not the towns have approved uh, retail adult use stores in their communities. Matt Kimball operates Black Bear Bud Company, an adult use marijuana dispensary in Portland. He says that they would be very interested in home delivery. Um, Kimball says, quote, I think definitely in the winter months where there are a lot of business businesses seem to slow down, I think it would be uh, huge for us, for a lot of people, especially for cannabis users. So being able to reach them uh, would be a huge incentive. Kimball agrees that the move uh, would make adult use marijuana more accessible to Mainers. Um, A workshop on the bill would happen as soon as next week, according to this article, Uh, something I'm going to follow closely. And, you know, in, in the town where I live, I can order from uh, three different retail locations, uh, but we don't have a storefront. So I, I definitely think that, uh, you know, likely I don't see why this wouldn't pass. And I think it's great to allow uh, more access to cannabis uh, to Mainers up there in Maine. My name is Chris Eggers, and I'm reporting for the State of Cannabis News Hour. Thanks, Rico. Absolutely, my Maine man. As a uh, uh, former Mainer, I guess, I think this is great because Maine's pretty rural and it's not easy for people to get to the dispensary all the time. And there's a lot of patients who aren't actual medical marijuana patients. So I think that this is great. It just also helps increase the revenue for the state, which they need. Great story. Thanks, Chris. Happy to bring it this morning. Happy Monday, everybody. I want to make a trip over that direction and go to Connecticut, too, and and see those uh, fun gifting events that they're having. I didn't realize that um, it was as far south as it was. For some reason, I thought it was really, really uh, north of Washington. But go Maine. We don't um, care about geography here in America. All right. Let's go back to Rico. Rico, you want to do your headline? All right. Yes, indeed. <clears throat> so mine's coming out of um, <clears throat> excuse me, South China Morning Post. Uh, Chinese tomb reveals ancient staple taste for cannabis. A new archaeological study in central China revealed potent cannabis is a dietary staple in the, Chi- in the ancient Chinese Tang Dynasty, which was 618 to 907 AD. Chinese history textbooks refer to the mass production of ancient Chinese cannabis as an economic activity used to produce clothing and textiles. While global cultivation has shrunk more than 90% since the 1960s, the last recorded government data at the end of 2019 suggested designated hemp fiber land in China increasing more than 30% annually by 60,300 acres um, with new cultivation tech increasing productivity more than three times in the same period. But what about THC? I was lucky enough early on in the pandemic to interview the late, great Hashashin himself, Frenchy Cannoli, who gave me an in-depth history lesson on the historical Chinese origins of cannabis trade, and I really dug into that shit for a while afterwards. It's common knowledge, ancient Chinese cultivated and consumed seeds in a kind of porridge, and uh, without much prior evidence, historical texts only suggested it was an important, important source of food. Archaeologists since the 1980s found and identified remnants in Chinese tombs dating as far back as 6,600 years ago, seeing the plant as a ritual item used to generate hallucinogens in religious ceremonies. But, the discovery, but this discovery confirms during peak Chinese civilization, weed was a source for not just mental stimulation, clothing, and medicine, but also nutrition. Details were just revealed last week, but the discovery was made in 2019 after construction workers unearthed the unusually dry tomb of cavalry captain Guo Xing under school playground in Taiyan, Shangxi province. Guo Xing fought Tang Emperor Li Ximin or Taizhong in a series of bloody battles on the Korean peninsula. After going 1,320 years undisturbed, this tomb was almost perfectly preserved with wall paintings and artifacts littered throughout the chamber. According to the article, uh, in one of many jars holding staple foods, researchers found remnants of cannabis with some seeds still showing original color. They were nearly twice as big as normal, suggesting they weren't quite the same as typical plants today. The seeds found still with their husks in them were cannabis sativa, species originating in Central Asia with lower concentrations of THC than modern cultivars, which are more potent hybrids of sativa and indica. The cannabis was stored in a pot on the coffin bed amid other staple grains such as millet. Obviously, descendants buried cannabis is important food crop, said Jin Gu, Gu Yun, uh, a professor with the School of History and Culture in Shandong University. 
China has banned cannabis since the 1950s, and today possession is a criminal offense with conviction likely resulting in the death sentence. But for many heartland-dwelling people during the Tang Empire, it seems cannabis was even more important than rice. The article states, Taiyan was warmer and wetter during the Tang Dynasty than today, and rice was cultivated in the wider Yellow River region. Interestingly, there was no rice found in the tomb where the veteran soldier um, who died 90 years young was found. Jin added that cannabis was buried as a food for the tomb owner's feast health in the afterlife. And furthermore, Guo Jing's seeds husks were not removed. The husk isn't known for taste, but higher levels of THC. The piece goes on to state ancient Chinese texts refer to cannabis as one of the Wu Gu, or five staple food crops, and eating too many unhusked seeds could, quote, make a person run about like mad, according to the Compendium of Materia Medica, a book written by herbalist Li Shijin about 500 years ago. According to Jin, cannabis seeds with husks are not only related to high lingon uh, content of the husk and its hard texture, which can reduce mold and prolong storage time, but also stimulate the nerves and cause hallucina- hallucinations due to consumption of husk for religious and medical purposes. This is some pretty exciting and interesting stuff if you're a history nerd like myself, um, and I'm always looking for clues to the past uh, for possible solutions for today's problems. Uh, hopefully, China's government will begin relaxing their laws around cannabis so we can find and appreciate more artifacts like these and the rest of the modern world can recognize and honor the nation as the true birthplace of the greatest plant on earth. This is Rico Lamit, dopest dad of the 21st century, reporting live for the State of Cannabis News Hour. Love to hear y'all's thoughts on this one. Back to you, Susan and Priscilla. I yeah. love this article, Rico. Sorry, go ahead, Susan. I, I was really surprised that the husk had THC in it. Did not know that. Well, so I think it's uh, uh, you know is interesting because even though they're so strict with people, uh, their residents using uh, cannabis in China, they are responsible for more than fifty percent of the production production of hemp uh, for the world. So, just really interesting. Well, hemp produces trichomes. Um, uh, Susan. So, I mean, they're often all over the plant, not just necessarily in the buds. So that's where. But on the husk, I mean, yeah, I've looked, I, I I've think looked that at was seeds mistake. under a microscope so many times. I, I don't, I don't see it. Rico, I just think that was an old mistake from old days. Rico, it could be. Is, is this is this a, a redo of the story um, of the tomb that they excavated a number of years ago, or is this a second tomb in China that they found that has cannabis remnants? Well, this is the tomb that they found two years ago, but they just released everything that they found in it, including uh, the research and um, a bunch of uh, different uh, archaeologists just praising everything that they found in there. Yeah, I was was under the impression that they actually found uh, buds in there that they actually could still smoke because of how they were preserved. So, Jason, would you smoke it if you had a chance? I would 100% try it just to say that I tried it. (laughs) Um, Hell yeah! But I, I, I <laughs> ancient it would booth taste horrible. <laughs> ancient <laughs> booth uh, definitely wasn't grown indoors. All right, with that, we are at time on that. Hold on, you don't know that, for Priscilla. That it definitely could have been grown indoors. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Highly uh, unlikely. <laughs> yeah. Uh, up next, we have our very own Liz Rogan. Uh, Liz is our um, an infamous pinup girl. She's also an edu- a cannabis educator, brand strategist, and healthcare consultant. Liz is founder of can- the Cannabis Business Council of Santa Barbara and our favorite paddleboarder. Liz, what do you have for us today? Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Priscilla. Happy Monday, and thanks for joining us today. My story comes from the Jerusalem Post by Aaron Reich. The headline reads, Is weed bad for you? Brain function could be impacted when sober, says a recent study. So this article you may have seen in a bunch of different places, but this one gave it the most fair. uh, So please, if you're going to share with people, I suggest you share this article. So a study by Canadian researchers published in the journal Addiction last week has been clickbait. So this is a little bit deeper dive to see how this sausage was made so we can see all the pieces. So a group of Canadian researchers analyzed 10 meta-analyses that quantitatively examined cannabis users from Um, on performance in cognitive tasks. So the conclusions of this study were that medical meta-analytic 
analytical data on the acute effects of cannabis use on neurocognitive function have shown that cannabis intoxication leads to small to moderate deficits in several cognitive domains. These acute impairments accord with documented residual effects, suggesting that the detrimental effects of cannabis persist beyond acute intake. Um, so I want to note this was done on the general population research. Meta-analyses are looking at a lot of other studies that have been done. There were only 10. And the research itself was sourced from PubMed and Google. So um, the a co-author, Dr. Alexandre Dumas, Dumas, associate clinical professor of psychiatry at the University of Montreal, said, our study enabled us to highlight several areas of cognition impaired by cannabis use, including problems concentrating and difficulties remembering and learning. He says cannabis use in youth may consequently lead to reduced educational attainment and in adults to poor work performance. And he said these consequences may be worse in regular heavy users. Well, NORML, uh, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, says researchers uh, from the University of Pennsylvania and the Perlman School of Medicine and the Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania reviewed data from 69 separate studies published be, um, and uh, involving 8,727 subjects, and they were frequent or heavy users, and they reported no significant long-term deficits in memory, attention, or other aspects of cognitive functioning that could be independently attributed to cannabis use, regardless of their age at initiation. So these findings uh, are in contrast to that other study. And they also um, are in contrast to similar studies assessing the impact of alcohol use and other controlled substances on cognition, which has shown medium to large effect sizes. So essentially what's that saying is alcohol and other controlled substances um, can cause, have more negative effects on cognition long term. The authors of that study uh, concluded that associations between cannabis use and cognitive functioning cross-sectional studies of adolescents and young adults are small and may be of questionable clinical importance for most individuals. Furthermore, absence of longer than 72 hours diminishes cognitive deficits associated with cannabis use. And they say results indicate that previous studies of cannabis use may have overstated the magnitude and persistence of cognitive deficits associated with cannabis use. Okay, so we're deep in some study data talk here today. So normal deputy director Paul Armentano said these conclusions are consistent with other previous studies. Recently, longitudinal twin studies reported that cannabis use is not independently associated with residual changes in intelligence, quotient, or executive function. So the findings combined with other recent studies report that cannabis exposure appears to have minimal adverse impact on brain morphology. So uh, cannabis, as we know here, is an extremely popular plant across the world, been used for centuries medicinally, as we just heard from Rico. Uh, and slowly but surely, the stigma is dropping, and the, increases, in the use has been increasingly normalized. And it's uh, shown to be a far less um, effect on your body versus other substances like tobacco or alcohol with few addictive traits with uh, so many medicinal uh, qualities that we all know, so I don't want to keep repeating this. It's neuroprotective, actually. It helps with anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder. It helps helps tremeal, sorry, helps heal traumatic brain injuries. And recent studies show promise with proof of cannabinoids for COVID treatment. I want to note that this research was looked at, done on research summarized online, so there's no methodology of method of ingestion, THC, other cannabinoid content, um, and if this isn't a problem with youth, which we know that um, male brains take till 25 to finish developing, measures can certainly be taken to mitigate these problems by promoting education and screening for any problematic use. So um, overall, these findings are important and show that cannabis should be used by adults carefully and in moderation. But most of all, it shows us how much more there is to learn and educate about. So um, this is Liz Rogan. I'm reporting for the State of Cannabis News Hour. I know we have Dr. Felicia on the table uh, today. I'm sure we're out of time, but I, this is an important topic. Thank you. And we have to be careful about meta-analyses. They tend to have a whole bunch of different studies done in different ways. And they're also very heavily weighted in reefer madness. Um, I picked one of the meta-analyses that your article is based on, done in 2018, and their studies range from 1973 to 2015. And we know that there was crazy publication bias that people could not get funding unless they were trying to prove that cannabis was harmful. So you know, it, to me, this is just a hodgepodge of 
bad studies mixed with some good ones, I'm sure, with a nice 2022 bow wrapped up on it. We are at time, but I, I just wanted to give uh, Mary Clifton a few seconds to weigh in. I think you've done a great job, Liz, and also Dr. Felicia of, of uh, shooting a bunch of holes into this data. We, you know, we also have to remember the population-based data from England and from the United States that look at people over 30 to 40 years that are just not showing these uh, cognitive deficits accumulating over time. Thank you. All right, let's keep smoking the news. We're known for smoking the greatest weed in the world and identifying most outdoor weed as boof. But the cannabis industry's longest continuously running retailer can also be found warm in his mink coat, deplaning a private jet down in Florida en route to discuss proposals for the desalinization of liberal tears with Donald Trump. Up next is Jason Beck. What you got for us this morning, my man? Oh, good morning, Rico. Hope everyone had a fantastic weekend and is already off to an amazing start on their work week. And today, my story comes from South Carolina, where the state house is poised to vote on a marijuana bill in the full Senate. Debate on legalizing medical cannabis in South Carolina will start on the Senate floor this week, representing a state house first in an eight-year effort. It's a vote Senator Tom Davis, Republican from Beaufort, has been fighting for since since launching the effort back in 2015. If you pound at the door long enough, if you make your case, if the public is asking for something, the state Senate owes a debate. Davis told the Post and Courier, who wants an up or down vote, the people of South Carolina deserve to know where their elected officials stand on this issue. Senators decided... Senators decided unanimously January 20th to put the conventional proposal to priority status, guaranteeing a vote in the chamber. Senators can, can't, can't move on their other legislation until they either approve or kill the bill dubbed the Compassionate Care Act, which would enable patients to legally use cannabis. The, the, the promised debate expected to begin January 25th or 26th gives the bill the best shot yet of South Carolina joining the 36 states already allowing medical cannabis as a medicine. U.S. Representative Nancy Mace, Republican from Charleston, South Carolina, an advocate of medical cannabis, plans to appear with Davis at the State House on Tuesday the 25th. David is confident a majority of senators agree with him and that will support uh, will only grow as he makes his case at the podium. His, he contends his crafted legislation that would create the most conservative medical marijuana program in the country as a result of continued opposition from law enforcement, most notably state law enforcement division uh, chief Mark Keel, who's highly respected in the state house. Under Davis's bill, smoking would marijuana would not be would would remain illegal. Um, instead, it would permit ingesting or using cannabis through products like like ointments, creams, oils, sprays, patches, and vaporizers. Patients could get up to a two week supply at a time, and a range of debilitating medical conditions would allow patients to legally partake, including cancer, post traumatic stress disorder, epilepsy, glaucoma, and any chronic pain for which opioids would otherwise be prescribed. Supporters contended marijuana is a better option than highly addictive opioids, and the bill, Senate. Uh, Senate 150 requires products to be tested and labeled and for dispensaries to go through a licensing process every two years. Former state rep Eric Bedingfield led the effort in the House after his eldest son, six, six year struggle with opioid addiction, ended up with an overdose, saying he believed it could help others hem their addictions. Like Davis, State Senator Stephen Goldfish, Republican from Georgetown, said he was moved by advocate Jill Swing and her daughter. I was vehemently opposed to medical cannabis in South Carolina, he said during a news conference January 19th. I thought this is the slippery slope. This is the avenue to recreational marijuana. This is what every pothead dreams of. But with Swing's daughter, he said he saw a young patient who immediately stopped convulsing with marijuana, a treatment so effective Swing was willing to risk getting arrested. They've been treated unfairly, Goldfish said, and it's time for South Carolina to get righteous and treat them fairly. Even if the bill passes the Senate, its fate is in the House is, is far from certain. Similar bills have never made it. Uh, to that chamber's floor. Plus, it could face a veto by Governor Henry McAster. Davis uh, sa said in the news conference he'd received a commitment from House Speaker J. Lucas that the bill would be allowed to move through the committee process. However, a spokesman for Lucas denied the Speaker had given any such guarantee. Senator Davis doesn't speak for Senator Lucas. Spokesman Nicolette Waters said Speaker Lucas looks forward to watching the Senate next week. 
Well, this is exciting news for South Carolina, and I'm wishing everyone out there um, the most support. I hope this bill is able to go through. South Carolina definitely needs to get some type of something on their books, and the only way to do that in South Carolina is through their state legislature. So kudos to all the uh, advocates that have been working diligently on this. And this is Jason Beck reporting for the State of Cannabis News Hour. I hate it when they use pothead in a derogatory way. I hate that. Me too. It's like they're talking down to people who consume. Props to all the people who are Props out there working for this because the compassionate we use are. is really important. Yes, indeed it is. Thank you so much for reporting on that article, Jason. Up next, next, we have Gretchen Gailey. She's our Washington insider and founder of Panoptic Strategies. Gretchen, what do you have for us this morning? Uh, good afternoon, Priscilla. Uh, my article is coming from Marijuana Moment. Um, and the headline is Banking Activity Increases in States That Legalize Marijuana Study Fines. While marijuana businesses often struggle to find banks that are willing to take them on as clients due to risks caused by the ongoing federal prohibition of cannabis, a new study found that banking activity actually increases in states that legalize marijuana. The research doesn't make a direct connection between state-level marijuana reform and the increased activity, but it does strongly imply that there's a relationship, even if the factors behind the trend aren't exactly clear. Researchers set out to investigate banking trends in states that have legalized cannabis, looking at bank regulatory filings with the FDIC from 2011 to 2016. They found evidence that banking activity, deposits, and subsequent loans increased considerably in legalizing states relative to non-legalizing states. That's in spite of the fact that the banks and credit unions run the risk of being penalized by federal regulators for working with businesses that deal with a federally controlled substance. It says, while uncertainty can result in overly cautious behavior and hinder economic activity, we do not find evidence of this with cannabis laws in the banking industry. Uh, That's what the authors wrote in their uh, study titled THC and the FDIC, Implications of Cannabis Legalization for the Banking System. The study analyzed data from 150,566 bank quarter observations from 6,932 unique banks located in 46 different states. It found that the deposits increased by an average range of 3.14 to 4.33% and bank lending increased by 6.5 to 8.6% post-legalization. Of course, it makes sense that legal states would see increased financial activity in the banking sector after opening a new market, even if only some banks choose to take the risk of working directly with cannabis businesses. The emerging marijuana industry also supports an array of ancillary firms and traditional companies that provide services to dispensaries and grow operations. As of June 30th, there were 706 financial institutions that had filed requisite reports saying they were actively serving cannabis clients. That's up from 689 in the previous quarter, but still down from a peak of 747 in late 2019. But the question remains why. Why are some banks deciding to take on marijuana clients while others remain wary of federal repercussions? The study authors from the University of Arizona, Drexel University, San Diego State University, and Scripps College put forward two possibilities about why the risk for regulatory uncertainty did not decrease banks' willingness to accept deposits or make loans. The increase may suggest that banks were either unconcerned about the potential risk associated with accepting cannabis-related deposits or optimistic about the chances that regulations will adapt to the needs of legalizing states. Uh, Confidence about working with federally illegal industry may well have been bolstered in 2014 when the FinCEN guidelines and the Obama administration issued guidance to financial institutions on reporting requirements for cannabis-related businesses. Second option is optimism optimism about federal reform. Um, Also seem possible. It's around this time that the Bipartisan Safe Banking Act was first introduced uh, and that there was a noticeable spike in financial institutions reporting that they have marijuana business clients. Um, I don't, I actually went through and read through the actual study uh, of the report and I think it's all a lot of bullshit. Um, I I, I don't like this headline. I mean, yes, okay, that loans and deposits increase in these states, but there's absolutely nothing in here that says that it has to do with cannabis. Um, And even if they did increase because of cannabis, that doesn't do anything to help uh, what, clients are actually facing when they deal with the banking of the high 
um, the high spending limits that they have to maintain, the high account balances, uh, the crazy fees that these banks are imposing upon them. Um, so while I think this headline tries to portray that banking is alive and well, uh, it's not it's not uh, competing at a regular uh, business rates that these folks need to uh, be a part of the general industry. This is Gretchen for State of Cannabis News Hour. You know, Gretchen, I don't know if I've mentioned this or not, but I got a, a bank account with Wells Fargo eight years ago for the nonprofit care. And it said, you know, I put right there, Cannabis Awareness Research and Economics uh, was the name of the business, is the name of the business. And I haven't had any problems at all. I know that I'm guess super fortunate, but they, the, the person that signed me up thought that I was a retail, a retailer. Yeah. What, it's, what, it's all over the place. Well, when I was at New Frontier Data, we went through four different banks. I know that. Um, because, and we were a data company. Yeah. We're like, we just write reports. We're a bunch yeah. of nerds who, a bunch of economists. Um, and we were shut down multiple times. Um, I I had no trouble when I set up my banking account for my business and I told them that I did. I worked with cannabis companies. Uh, They did not seem to care. I think it's really luck of the draw, at least when it comes to ancillary businesses. I think for actual operators, it's a completely different story. Stripe, whenever I add Stripe to something, Stripe uh, shuts me down and I send them an email and say, uh, this is a nonprofit organization. We're simply educating and they put it back up. But every time... I put something up on Stripe. We may have to do. That's a bank. We may have to do another deep dive, but let's keep going. Bucks at bank. <laughs> yes, we've got we've got haters lots of stories. Hate, let's keep... That's what haters do. Mm. Hmm. Okay. So up next, <laughs> she's a cannabis chef who creates new wellness solutions for sexual healing and knows just how to rub a sound bath bowl right. Up next, you know it. It's D Sugar Copland Easy. <laughs> what you got for us this morning, Sugar? Thank you so much, Rico. Good day and evening. Good day or evening, everyone. Now, although there is more to this article, please check out the link. My headline is from New York Post, co-written by Bernadette Hogan and Bruce Golding. You know, cannabis in New York have been quite the bedfellows over these last few weeks with the headlines, I'd say. One article was titled, New York will establish a $200 million fund to support social equity applicants seeking adult use cannabis business licenses. Another read, Rise of the Farmers, small New York group becoming cannabis power player. And yet another reads, Governor Hochul's proposed massive $216 billion budget fuel by COVID relief, but not all that money is for COVID relief. And then today, my headline, Governor Hochul's budget projects $1.25 billion in revenue from cannabis sales over next six years. The state plans to reap more than $1.25 billion in new revenue from legal cannabis sales during the next six years, according to the fiscal 2023 spending plan the governor proposed last week. The first year's take is a relatively puny $56 million, with most of the money, $40 million, coming from licensing fees paid by growers and sellers based on figures in the briefing book on the proposed $216.3 billion budget. Since revenues from tax hikes on the wealthy are part of this proposed $216 billion budget plan she proposed last week, I recommend using some of those funds to fulfill the $200 million for social equity cannabis businesses instead of having 50% of the licensees waiting for tax revenues and licensing fees to come from the other half of the licensees through revenues. Those fees are expected to start rolling in later this year. And storefront sales of recreational cannabis are likely to begin in 2023. But as I recall from a few previous articles by my colleagues Gretchen and Priscilla, social equity applicants have been told there will be education and funding for their licensing and fees. As I recall, Amber Littlejohn, executive director of MCBA, states that she supports the ideas of the funding, but question what it would do to the timeline of social equity applicants entering the newly formed market. She states her concern of seed funding coming from the licensing fees and taxes more likely means money won't be available as promised to social equity applicants until after the adult use market is up and running. She also questioned the private funding. Well, here's a solution to the problem. The governor stated that she would make the budding industry a high priority. Is this true? If so, why would social equity applicants waiting for funding be so slowly funded? She stated that 40% of the state's revenues will go to education with another 40% earmarked for the new community grants reinvestment fund and the remaining 20% to drug pre- treatment programs. With Governor Hochul's proposed budget, I see funds easily being able to be distributed through some of the $7 billion, 
going towards education. Give some of that to social equity business education. Why wait till those tax dollars and licensing fees from licensees are earned and collected? Now, my opinions are my own, and my, I'm no budget expert, nor do I have a law degree, but I see money being available for social equity applicants before these taxes and fees come in. Why must they wait for others to succeed in the cannabis industry while sitting on the sidelines, watching, preparing to jump in double Dutch style? That's ludicrous. Priscilla, I can't truly wait to hear uh, your interview with Reuben McDaniel. I'd love to hear more about the Social Equity Fund. This is D. Sugar Copeland Easley reporting for the State of Cannabis News Hour. What say you, Priscilla? Definitely. I mean, uh, I can tell you that, um, you know, from speaking to him, and, and yes, Susan, we need to announce that interview with uh, Reuben McDaniel. He's the um, head of uh, DASNY, D A S N Y. Um, but social equity is definitely number one on his agenda. So how this actually rolls out, this fund that just got approved, is going to be really interesting. I think the uh, $1.25 billion in revenue, uh, that projection is, is kind of kind of low. I thought so, too, especially I, over I the agree, period. It's New York. Yeah, $200 it's, million it's is way very small. <laughs> they did a billion dollars in Arizona this year. They're, right. They're probably banking on the illicit market having a stronghold like it does in California. Did you say banking? No, the market He's always saying keep smoking the news. Well, up next, we have Miss Menica. Miss Menica is uh, just one of our favorite correspondents. Uh, Miss Menica, what do you have for us today? Thank you so much, Priscilla. Good morning, everyone. I'm talking about money in politics and federal cannabis reform today. This story comes from Politico, and the headline reads, Big Weed is on the brink of scoring big political wins. So where are they? The premise of the article is that while legalization has spread across the country, even in staunchly conservative states, and is expected to become a $40 billion industry by 2025, it remains a relatively small player in D.C., This is in part because the industry is divided and in part because it's not investing much in the influence peddling game that its main competitors play. The article refers to wine, spirits, and beer as cannabis' main competitors. So let's talk about the divisions first. To sum it up, there are those who first seek to help those harmed by criminal enforcement and those who feel better business conditions should be the priority. Some industry lobbyists and legalization advocates say that a lack of consensus on legislative strategy is holding the movement back. Some groups push for comprehensive overhaul with the aim of helping people harmed by criminal enforcement, while others seek any piecemeal policy victory that could provide momentum for sweeping changes in the future. An anonymous industry lobbyist said, quote, there are certain people who are willing to forego any of it if they don't get all of it. The lobbyists noted that such a viewpoint is not universally shared, causing a disagreement, quote, that's stunting the legalization effort. Safira Galoub, the executive director of the National Cannabis Roundtable and a lobbyist, said, quote, I think it can be difficult for members of Congress who are just getting educated to understand who they should be listening to. And she acknowledged that cannabis is not the only industry that suffers from an array of di- diverging voices. I want to also note uh, that the article quotes several anonymous industry lobbyists and larger organizations, but it's not obvious to me that small or legacy businesses are represented in this perspective. Let's move on to the money. So according to the piece, the second reason for stalled federal reform may be a lack of federal lobbying expenditures. Even as cannabis has grown into this multi-billion dollar industry, Our lobbying dollars are light relative to other industries. So I'm going to provide a few figures for the full year from Open Secrets uh, rather than the figures from the article because those relied on Q1 to Q3 and I want to give you Q1 to Q4. According to OpenSecrets.org, the top five cannabis lobbying clients spent a combined $1.7 million in 2021. Meanwhile, the top five tobacco lobbying clients spent over $21 million in 2021, and the top five beer, wine, and liquor lobbying clients spent over $13 million. The article mentions that cannabis lobbying efforts are increasingly happen- happening at the state rather than the federal level. And at least six D.C. lobbyists told Politico that their focus is increasingly looking to states or grassroots public support campaigns. 
And while some try to push federal and state change with lobbying dollars, others argue that it's really about elections and the shift towards federal legalization will simply take time and require us to elect younger candidates who won't stand in the way of uh, federal reform as their older colleagues have. Uh, To close out, the headline asks, where is big weed? But the article doesn't offer a clear answer. It does appear to suggest that big weed is not taking advantage of the opportunity in D.C., blaming those who won't sacrifice social justice and the lack of federal spending relative to other industries. And as we near the midterm election, some advocates are afraid that the window to act is closing. So I would love to hear from our Washington insider, Gretchen Gailey. Are divisions and lack of lobbying the reason that federal reform hasn't happened? Or might something else, like generational attitudes towards cannabis among our current elected officials, be the reason that big weed hasn't scored uh, political wins yet? This is Menika Mahajan reporting for the State of Cannabis News Hour. Over to you, Gretchen. Menika, um, um, re- as a PhD and a political economist, um, do you think, just really quick before Gretchen comments, do you think that their numbers are correct? Uh, no, I do not. You mean the the disclosure numbers and the whether they're representative of how much, is that what you're asking? Yes, yes. Is it, are these numbers we can rely on? I think that they're probably light because not everything does get disclosed and campaign finance laws allow, um, uh, I I see that we're at time on this headline, but I'm going to just say, no, I don't think that the figures are fully reliable. Um, Well, honestly, I would say that I think the figures are probably reliable when it comes to the low amount the cannabis is spending on lobbying. I agree with you, Menica, on the problems with cannabis are all of the above. The industry is too divided on what they want. Uh, They're not spending the money that they should be. Um, There is obviously generational problems with passing cannabis. There is just a whole shit storm that is working against cannabis. Um, And with the industry being so divided, it's not coming together anytime soon. Um, And yes, the window is absolutely closing. um, If you want to get more uh, liberal perspectives in there with laws that are passing, Um, I think when these guys talk about, oh, we want to go more states and grassroots approach, that's those are the MSOs we're talking because they, it works well for them to keep shit um, without having federal legalization so they don't have to compete. There doesn't have to be interstate commerce. They can keep having these monopolies in the states. Um, so yep. it's all screwed up. And anyone who had money to spend on cannabis has been just dis- disenfranchised over the years of nothing happening in Washington. The reality, the reality of all this is that the nail polish industry is far more politically astute than the cannabis industry. And there's so many different factions within the cannabis space. You have the advocacy groups that want social justice reforms and you have the MSOs that want to hamper down commerce within state lines so they can keep prices artificially high on the patient and consumer base. And then you have other groups that I'm affiliated with that want to open up interstate trade. And you have a big battle going on in Washington, D.C. on all those fronts. Agreed. And uh, Jason, like you always say, man, the golden rule, the one with the gold makes the rules. So up next, she's the P-L-A-N-T-S, that's pronounced plants, for life CEO, a dual board certified physician with an affinity for helping folks understand and manifest the immense power they have over their personal health while using cannabis as it was intended as medicine. Dr. Felicia Dawson, what you got for us this morning? Thank you so much, Rico. Happy Monday, everyone, and happy 200th show, uh, Susan. Funny how no one mentioned Big Pharma in that whole conversation we just had. Anyway, Kaiser Kaiser Permanente. My headline comes from Kaiser Permanente Spotlight. Researchers seek answers for pregnant patients about cannabis. Kaiser Permanente researcher Kelly Young-Wolf, PhD, MPH, has watched the rate of cannabis use among pregnant patients steadily rise over the past several years. During the first nine months of the pandemic, it took a sudden jump from 6.75% to 8.14% of pregnant patients testing positive during a prenatal visit with Kaiser Permanente in Northern California. And the researchers hypothesized that stress due to the pandemic may be the reason for these increasing numbers. I will have to say that Kaiser does a good job of screening for mental health issues and trauma. They found that the women using cannabis tended to be two to three times more likely to have anxiety, depression, and or are victims of domestic violence. 
stress due to the pandemic is real. Pregnancy can be very challenging, physically and mentally, in and of itself. A recent study done prior to the availability of the COVID vaccine on infants exposed to the virus versus those who had not been exposed showed that there was no statistical difference between the exposed and the unexposed on neurodevelopmental testing. However, there is a statistically significant difference in the neurodevelopmental testing of babies born during the pandemic versus those who were born prior to the pandemic. So stress due to the pandemic is very, very real. There are individuals in this country that want to tell women what they can and cannot do with their bodies while simultaneously obstructing legislation and resources that could help lessen the stress of pregnant women. The stress of the pandemic, homeschooling, being a frontline or essential worker, caring for other children, older parents in background, in the background of systemic racism is a lot to deal with. We as a nation must continue replacing the millionaires in Washington, D.C. with regular folk who have a clue about what it's like to live out here in these streets of the United States of America. This is Dr. Felicia Dawson reporting for the State of Cannabis News Hour. What do you all think? I would hate to be pregnant during this pandemic. It sucks, but it having happens. A baby. <laughs> having a baby during the pandemic sucked too. Yeah, but Dr. Felisa, you bring such great points. Um, this is all very, very important uh, to women's rights in general. Access to this medicine is needed uh, for pregnant women, uh, for mothers, um, for postpartum. There's so much that women can benefit from. We need more studies. We need to demand this uh, from the industry. Uh- other physicians have mentioned to me how it's like, you know, you're kind of looking at like what is more detrimental also. A lot of these other conditions that women are experiencing during these times are. I just want to say for, for all the families out there having babies, it's got to really suck because you have an unlimited supply of babysitters available at your disposal since no one's working, but you have nowhere to go because all the businesses are closed down. Well, that was a great article. Uh, actually, there's it's hard to find help. A lot of people are not wanting to work because of the, the, the virus. But anyway, up next, we have Mr. Christopher Smith. Uh, Christopher is a communications strategist and publisher of the American Cannabis Report. He is also State of Cannabis's Clark Kent. Chris, what do you have for us today? Good morning. Thank you, Priscilla. Good morning, Rico. Good morning, Susan. My story today is from Thrillist, and I hope I don't blow the pronunciation of this name. Shania Bullock is bringing ancestral wisdom to mainstream cannabis. From South Dakota to Nevada, native tribes are getting into mainstream cannabis game, and they're doing it on their own time. As sovereign nations, these tribes have the right to conduct cannabis businesses in states that have legalized cannabis, even if the state government has not yet brought their cannabis system online. This is federally possible by a 2014 Department of Justice memo that allows recognized tribes with responsible cannabis businesses to operate without prosecution. Although, if we're being real, cannabis has been grown in these lands for a long, long time, longer, long before the federal government decided what plants could or could not be grown in this country. Which is why Shanai Bullock, a Shinnecock Indian Nation tribal member and descendant of the Montauk tribe in Long, uh, Long Island, New York, is currently developing her nation's cannabis business in the Hamptons as a managing director of a company called Little Beach Harvest, a medical cannabis operation established by and located on lands of the Shinnecock Nation. Little Beach Harvest recently announced a major partnership with prominent multi-state operator Tilt Holdings that will allow them to scale operations while maintaining control of them. So the very weird reason why they're partnering with Tilt is because tribes cannot access social equity programs that stem from the state's state government's uh, cannabis laws. So this kind of partnership with a larger company that respects tribal sovereignty is a game changer for this group. Uh, Cannabis has always been a way of life for Bullock and the Shinnecock Nation. Her grandfather grew cannabis on the family homestead. Her mother cooked with it. Her grandmother cooked with it. Uh, Many of her elders she spent time with were activists in the past century, not only introducing her to plant medicine, but the importance of cultural preservation and maintaining honored traditions. 
The timing of this move might seem like a strategically sound business move because multiple states have passed legislation, but they're mired in delays getting licenses. And in this dead period, the tribes are allowed to get a head start. This includes the St. Regis Mohawk tribe in upstate New York, as well as the Flandreau Santee Sioux in South Dakota, where Governor Christy Nome is trying to steal cannabis rights and women's rights to control their own bodies. But Bullock says, in most businesses, there is this competitive energy rooted in colonist, a colonist mindset. I like to aim for doing what's best for the Shinnecock Nation. Whatever New York State is doing is what they're doing. We handle things as the people of the Stony Shore the way we've done things since time immemorial. Uh, her group has established his own cannabis regulatory division with Shinnecock board members, and they're already working on uh, issuing licenses for growing and sales. The tribe will be reflected in the company and in, in the new partnership in every way. Members who are experienced in uh, and interested in cultivation will inform production processes, and grow the grow itself will hire tribe-owned construction businesses wherever possible to stimulate the tribal economy and, uh, in general, with uh, tribal ancillary business. Businesses. There's a grander vision for this group for, uh, uh, to create a retail destination where people can visit Shinnecock land, peruse Shinnecock cr- curated products, and relax and converse in the wellness lounge. It comes back to inherent responsibility, Bullock says. It's not even about my family or just Shinnecock. It's about inclusion of indigenous voices and leadership in an industry that we've already been doing for on our lands for decades. It's about implementing real change at a crucial time in a new industry and preserving this ancient plant medicine that could really heal the world in many ways. There we go. Thank you, Christopher. We're getting some great history lessons today. Um, we need to keep moving so we can squeeze Adelia in. All right. So she's the CMO of the Event High and advisor of International Cannabis Business Women Association, board member for San Diego Americans for Safe Access, and co-host of Blunt Brunch event series, bringing women in the industry together. One of my favorite people in the industry for nearly six years now. What's happening, Adelia? Bring us home. Hello, hello. Six years, man. Okay, let's get to this title, though. Uh, Avera Tech Revolutionizing Cannabis and Tourism in the Caribbean Through Technology. A U.S. Virgin Islands-based tech company, Avera Tech, is on a mission to leverage technology uh, to revolutionize the Caribbean tourism. In less than two years, the millennial-led startup has developed a a suite of mobile apps aimed at enhancing the tourist experience while simultaneously mitigating the spread of COVID-19 virus amidst the ongoing global pandemic. The company's first initiative initiative um, was a direct response to the sub- substantial growth in the global cannabis industry. Uh, they launched it called Avera Cannabis Suite, which was created to facilitate the sale of cannabis and cannabis products to Virgin Islanders and visitors over 21 years old. Uh, what is significant about their transactions that will be handled through Avera's API is the patient registry services to provide all adults over the age of 21 with legal cannabis legal registration cards. Car- legal registration cards called a day pass, the telemedicine capabilities, uh, which would provide medical cannabis registration cards to tourists, along with their point of sale technology, which is a solution for all transactions, which allows a seed to sale tracking and safe, secure processing of the revenue and tax payments. Uh, in addition to fulfilling the tourists, uh, the needs of the tourists and creating a channel of income for residents, Pemberton says the app provides the government with specific protocols to allow all transactions needed to manage the industry. Um, They also offer contactless business services through the app. Pelago is an excursion manager app uh, created specifically for scheduling and paying tourism activities. And then the contact tracing is called Cronius Contact Tracing, which is a fully integrated solution that unifies uh, what they know as the four pillars of tourism tech, government, tourists, residents, and of course, technology. Uh, through these three apps, Avera intends to leverage technology to revive the Caribbean tourism industry. And this is just the beginning. Um, Pemberton and his partners actually have a plan to expand throughout the region, starting with Jamaica in 2022. This is Adelia, and I'm reporting for the State of Cannabis News Hour. Thank you so much, Adelia. Perfect timing. That was a really great show. If you missed any of it, make sure to catch the replay or find us anywhere you get your podcasts or on our YouTube channel a few hours after the show. A big thank you to all of the correspondents that comb through all the headlines each day to bring us just what we need to know. A big thank you to Priscilla and Rico for co-producing the show and our pinup girl, Liz Rogan. Thank you, audience, for being our eyes and ears when there is news in your city, county, 
place, state, or country. Your addition to our show makes the State of Cannabis News Hour news you can trust. You've been tuned in to the State of Cannabis News Hour, where we collectively move policy forward in an inclusive and sustainable way. Start your morning on a high note and join us every weekday at 9 a.m. Pacific time for the State of Cannabis News Hour, your daily dose. For the lawyers, we are going to do the disclaimer. The thoughts and opinions expressed in the State of Cannabis News Hour are those of the individual speakers, not those of any other speakers, State of Cannabis, or its members. Thank you, everyone. That was a great show. Legal or accounting advice and State of Cannabis and its speakers. Ring your, no ring my bell, sugar. Legal status of any substance in any country, area, or territory, or any other authorities. The views expressed in this room do not establish any fiduciary relationships. The sponsorship of the State of Cannabis News Hour do not imply or constitute any endorsement by the State of Cannabis or the expressions of any of the opinions whatsoever on the part of the State of Cannabis or any of its speakers. Say goodbye, Rico. Goodbye.